Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, where we're going to interview people around the world who are making news. And I have on the other line via Skype, Mrs. Lorna Ashworth, and uh, she was a uh, many time, many year uh, worker within General Synod at the Church of England, uh, working with the business meetings and other things. And uh, I've run across her names a couple times on the blogs and uh, news things. And uh, last week she did something remarkable and I got emails from David Virtue, from Gavin Asherton, from all others saying, you need to interview her. I said, okay, I can do that. Uh, we don't interview a lot of lay people here, but we should. And I said, all right, let me uh, track her down. And she was gracious enough to reply to my email and said, yeah, okay, well, I'll talk to you, Kevin. It'd be kind of fun. Um, first, we had a little pre-show the other day and I had a distinct uh, uh, hearing in my ear that you were not from London. Uh, let's let's give the audience a little bit about your background. Well, I was raised um, a Mennonite in Saskatchewan in ah. Canada, so a long way from Anglicanism. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I too was not uh, raised in the Anglican Church, and um, one day somebody introduced me to a prayer book, and I said, uh, "You read to God? I don't think that's you know uh, succinct or necessary." And I I soon fell in love with it, and uh, and talking to you kind of had the, the same type of experience. That's right. It did start with an Englishman, and then after that, it was the church. He's. <laughs> I I met my husband, who is English, on uh -huh. mission, Jamaica, and then um, turned out he was Anglican, and uh, I started my life in England, and yeah, encountered the Church of England, and that yeah, loved it. And there's much to appreciate and like about the Church of England. Uh, you somehow uh, uh, got involved in the, in church politics, the the general sin and stuff like that. How did that happen? Well, you know, people have often said, if you have concerns or you've got comments to make about something, then put your money where your mouth is and get involved. Mm -hmm. And once I understood quite, you know, how the Church of England was structured, the influence that historically it sought to have in the nation, I just thought, I want to be a part of that and, yeah, and, and see that it's doing its job. It's telling people about Jesus. And I, I wanted to, yeah, to see that that was happening. I was nosy. <laughs> 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 well, which is good. That's kind of, a, I, I have the same type of story. One day I uh, cl complained to my priest about a book I read that was published by the Episcopal Church, a little red book, and he said, oh, Kevin, we need to get you involved in the church. <sighs> so here you are. You've uh, arrived on Anglican Unscripted's radar screen. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the news from last week. You've been obviously involved in the Church of England for many years now. You said it's time to step away and resign because the church has gone liberal. Now, in fairness, it's gone liberal a long time ago, but let's talk a little bit about your thought process. Well, I think when I first got on to, you know, General Synod and things, I, I was aware that there are people with radically different opinions, and the Church of England claims to be a very broad church. And I was aware of that. So then the heart becomes, well, how can we... How can it not be a broad church in the right sense? Um, how can we be made up of different people but have the same belief? And so I, I think as the years have gone on, I've just seen that erosion. Just it, It's becoming more rapid. And where we've been able to have at least some debate, um, biblical debate around these very controversial issues, it just feels that that's just drained. It's, it's gone. And the narrative is so strongly... Um, you know, emotion, unity, um, good disagreement, and and we've just lost our way. And I think I began to be challenged maybe a year ago, but the, that intensified in these last few months where you're just thinking, I'm sitting around the table, I've been elected to these other bodies, you know, you go higher up, as it were, in the structures. We're sitting around the table and we're having these, these conversations and we are using the same words, but with different meanings, different definitions and different end goals. And I just think, well, what's the point? And because those end goals are so significant, not secondary issues, we're talking, you know, gospel issues, fundamental to people's salvation, there is no such, you can't have good disagreement around, you know, life issues. And, you know, people are like, what do you mean life or death issues? Well, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is a life or death issue. There's no, you can't have good disagreement and say that it doesn't matter. Uh, 
or, or that it doesn't, it, you know, the fact that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, oh, this whole substitutionary atonement or whatever it is, it, it just, none of it matters. Well, that's just the start of the erosion, isn't it? It's, it? If we don't abide by the word of God, we don't believe that we are sinners, that we have been saved and you know forgiven and my life has been transformed, you know, Romans 12 stuff, what is the church teaching? It has it has no message to offer. I mean, I could just go be part of the rugby club. And I get that's what we're seeing in the European churches and in, in here in America too, is the church has decided to par be parallel with the society, um, with you know the, the strangeness going around us, and uh, become liberalized. Uh, I can't at all see how we can yell radical inclusion and not throw the gospel out. And uh, obviously you're seeing that as well in uh, the Church of England. Now, you made this announcement last week. There's been a lot of response. I see the BBC, I see the Daily Mail, I see the Telegraph, all responding to a church that they made liberal. And now they build up the, this uh, repertoire of, oh, look what the conservatives are finally doing. They're leaving the church. Well. There have um, I had a I had a letter after last July's synod just saying you know if you feel the church is so corrupt why don't you just leave and go start your own? Well, my challenge at that point you know even though I had my my internal you know battle going on it was should I stay should I go? My response to this this person was to say well actually you're you're the one who's changing the doctrine and the teaching you're, you're the ones who are diverting I think perhaps you might feel more comfortable if you left. Um, you know, and we can have these playground kind of debates, but, you know, people are looking at me and kind of going, well, shouldn't you stay and fight, you know, and, and, and I, I get that, but I'm getting shouldn't you stay and fight from two kinds of people. Um, the liberals who are saying, yeah, so let's have good disagreement, let's, let's stay and discuss these is is issues. I'm like, well, there's nothing to discuss. Um, and then, and then from you know, from fellow you know Orthodox believers who are saying you know please stay, and I, I understand that they're longing for that, and we, we long to see the Church of England reformed, but I think I think we've come to a point, quite frankly, where the Orthodox voice is so is such a minority, you know even sitting on the Archbishop's Council, or you know other other groups, one or two voices or two or three voices. Um, that they don't hear you because the agenda is so big, the juggernaut is moving so rapid that it's just, you know, it's, it's not like we're being knocked knocked to the side. I'm not afraid of the fight. I think as, as, as Christians, we know that we've been called, you know, to stand for Christ and sometimes that, that's gonna hurt. So because many of us are not, we're not afraid of the fight, but I just think looking at our surroundings, we have to be realistic about where I wanna put my time and energy. And I think for me, the ongoing battle, just going, you know what? I really miss talking about Jesus and about the saving message of Christ. And it, you know. it it's a kind of ironic. We're 500 years out from the Reformation, and the Church of England looks nothing like it did 500 years ago, uh, 400, 300 years ago. Um, and it needs Reformation within it. But maybe you agree with me. They don't understand that they're in need of Reformation. Well, the Reformation is, is a joke and again in some corners, and then there are other people, you know, like us who, who take that seriously, you know. There is a Reformation because something has gone wrong. And I, I've been using the word, and I use the word in my statement, heresy. And people are like, you, 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 that's such a strong word, you, you can't use that word. Well, actually, you know, I'm not going to get out a dictionary, I'm just going to sit here as a little simple person and say, heresy is something that's not the gospel, it's the opposite to the gospel. So yes, we need reformation because unless the gospel is being taught in the church, it is not a church. So reformation, absolutely. Uh, what types of things do you think need to happen within the Church of England uh, for it to reform? There is one word that comes that came straight to my mind and that is repentance. Mm. Repentance from the top down. And it, I, I feel that as Christians who are so influenced by culture and society and what people think, we have lost what it is to fear the Lord. You know, the fear of God. And it, you know, it's something I pray for my children 
when they were little and praying over to them, you know, they'd go to bed at night. And I would just pray that my children would fear the Lord, because if they fear the Lord, they will fear nothing else. And, and I think the church has lost that. What is holiness? What does it mean to fear the Lord? And our pride has become, you know, whether it's as a culture or as a church, or whether we have pride by belonging to different bodies, we have lost the sense of what it means to repent. Because when we, when we use that word repent, it means that we acknowledge that something's wrong. But if you're in a church that has conveniently swept away words like sin, um, you know, offending God, there's no need there's no need to repent. You know, it's, we're so busy, um, preoccupied on the fact that God is love, that he's nothing else. So actually, rather than my God being so big to be inclusive, they have actually shrunk this God, and he's become, you know, quite quite a tiny, useless, impotent it, I have to agree with you. It's interesting to see that the, the God of the Church of England has become the cloudy God of Monte Python. You know, days, and that's, yeah, I, I, it concerns me greatly. Um, now, a lot of people, when they leave a church, uh, just go home, don't do anything else. Um, I'm sick and tired of it. It didn't work for me. Uh, they wouldn't listen to me. You have other ministries to do, though. You know, yes, and that's the one thing that struck me in July Synod when I just felt, I felt that the lights went out, quite mm -hmm. frankly. That's, that's exactly how I felt. But also at the same time, there was a growing confidence. And perhaps I needed reminding that the gospel of Christ is so far beyond this that when people encounter Jesus, whatever others say or, or what, you know, they describe the word of God as being offensive or you can't tell people about sin. I sat there and went, you know what? The culture hates it, but the gospel of Christ is, is a life changer. His words are life giving. And my confidence in his word, again, just, I think it, it just swelled in my heart. And I needed for it to do that. I needed to be reminded that the message of Christ is unstoppable. So as I continue to belong to my, my parish church, um, the opportunities to be a part of home group and, and you know, perhaps speak at other, you know, women's events or, or various things, opportunities to share God's word, um, I'm going to look forward to that because I, I think I think sometimes we just we need a refreshing. You know, you can get so caught up in all the politics when you when you're in sin on for so long and and it and it becomes very very cynical, very negative. And I think I just I want to spend some time just being in God's word with other people, encouraging them, discipling, and when I have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus to to do that and just to see you know what what is next. How does the Lord want me to use my my skills, my experience, my gifts. Um, and right now it'll probably be a little bit more focused in the, in the local church. Uh, and that's, that's a delight. I've, I've been involved in youth ministry for years. I'm not doing that at the moment. Um, but there are new seasons and new chapters. You mentioned the July Senate, and I got to watch some of the video from there. And it seemed, in my opinion, that the gospel was booed, that the, the good news of Christ was, uh, <laughs> You know, we're so beyond that. We don't need that the gospel in our church. We, we, we're kind of like, more like the United Nations. We're here to help people, give them mosquito nets, uh, save the planet from the, the dastardly, sinful climate change. And uh, we're going to be a church of affirmation, not transformation. Was that your experience as well? Yes. Yeah. And um, and I've been criticized for, for saying such. But you know what? When... when um when various people got up and quoted scripture into the debates, you could feel that, oh, you know, here, here they go again, or the groan, or that. And, and it is, it's because people think they're so beyond, you know, to scripture. So as if you open your Bible, it's like, oh, you're such a simpleton. You know, you know, we've moved beyond that. We've elevated to another level of spirituality or something. And it's like, well, no, because if you lose your place, excuse me, if you're not anchored in the gospel, you have no anchor. And, and that was the sense. Say the Bible, say another passage, and the eyes get rolled, the eyebrows go up. Oh, they're opening their Bible. And absolutely, because they, you know, people need to be aware. Um, Hebrews 4.12, you know, the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than in two any, uh, than a double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. 
and and again we forget that that is the life-giving power of the word and we're poor for it if, if we're not standing in it you know um eating it drinking it absorbing ourselves in it a lot of times i i see the church you know bad news like uh, a very popular person like you resigns and oh we can weather that no big deal we'll just for the next month or so we won't do anything bad we'll keep all the news straight and uh what you know as long as we cross our t's and dot our i's uh this we can get past this time with uh mrs ashworth and then i open the papers monday uh in london and i see that uh, the, the Church of England says in its schools, it's, it's fine to have uh, little boys wearing tiaras because we don't want them to feel bullied or uh, unsupported by our schools. And I'm like, oh boy, I, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I don't think they're, they're weathering or understanding the reason you resigned. No, I, I, I wish people would sit up and take notice that the Church of England has lost its anchor and it's drifting. Mm -hmm. And wherever the winds will buffet it, it just goes. And we can't forget that there's a big media machine behind what goes out from Church House and what's spoken about, you know, the kind of message that, that they want to put out. And, they're so, and the media machine seems to be so desperate to put out that we're inclusive, we're, accept uh, we're accepting, and it's like, don't they understand that the gospel itself is accepting, that it includes all who come to him? And they don't. And it's, I, as, as I read that, I just went, oh, there's the media machine trying to come up with a great story to make the Church of England look like well, we understand all the crises in culture. And as a matter of fact, it matters more to us, you know, what culture thinks of us, what society thinks of us as a church. So let's get the message right. But the message is the wrong message. Because we still love people. We still want to support people. We want to help people. But the assumption is, if people perceive the church to be anti this or anti that or against this or against that, clearly you don't love, clearly you don't understand, clearly you don't listen. But that's a failure to understand what it is to be a Christian. Because we do long to serve people and love people. And sometimes that means saying, this is wrong, or you need help, or how can I support you? And, and all that kind of thing. But it's not what the media machine wants. There's been a lot of response from bishops and people uh, who were part of the General Senate and the business meetings with you. Oh, she shouldn't have left. I wish she would have stayed. Um, in these messages that you've read as, probably as well, do you think they really understand why you left? That's a good question. Um, I think some people do. And, and I think there there are raps who don't quite understand. And I think part of that story of understanding why I stood down, the stuff we've been talking about, but there's another side too. And that is, if the Lord has convicted someone specifically to do something, for me it's a matter of obedience. Um, I don't want to judge my other brothers and sisters in the Lord who have stayed on. Um, I, I might have differing opinions about how we have to go about doing what we're doing and even perhaps the state of the Church of England. But then it's going to boil down for me that one more level too, which is if the Lord has convicted me of something, I have to obey. Mm. And I had hit that point. And for me to not step down would be an act of disobedience. And my heart was heavy with it. Ah, well, I want to thank you for your time, uh, Lorna. Uh, please do keep us updated as to your, your ministries and what you've been doing. And we do ask the audience to keep you in prayers as you uh, go through this transition. And we do pray uh, constantly for the, the reformation of the Church of England and all churches that have forgotten that they're not about affirmation, they're about transformation. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I want to thank you for uh, spending some time with us. Thank you.